Good morning, I'm Archdeacon Martin. It's such a shame that we can't be together physically this morning, as I was looking forward so much to spending time with you today. But hopefully we can meet up properly uh, before too long. I also wanted to say a huge thank you to Martin, Paul and Sally, the other members of the staff team, and indeed to all of you for all that you're doing to enable the mission and ministry of God's church to continue through these difficult times. The effort that you're putting in is incredible and really is hugely appreciated. A woman who was heavily pregnant with twins was involved in a car crash and she ended up in a coma. While she was unconscious, her twins were delivered. And when she came round, the nurse told her that she had two healthy twins and that her brother was now looking after them until she was well enough to go home. Not my brother, the woman exclaimed. He's hopeless. It's all right, said the nurse. He's doing really quite a good job and he's even given them names. Oh no, you're kidding, said the mother. What's he called them? Well, I think he's called the first one Denise. Oh, that doesn't sound too bad at all, said the mother. What's he called the boy? De nephew, replied the nurse. Names are important, aren't they? When our only son was born, Monica, my wife and I thought long and hard about what names to give him. It took us seven years to be blessed with a child, so in our eyes, he kept, when he came along, he was quite a miracle. We decided to give him three Christian names, Joshua, Nathan, Anthony. Joshua means God saves, Nathan means gift from God, and Anthony means priceless, and in fact was almost so my wife's maiden name. For us as parents, there is so much wrapped up in Joshua's name and identity. In our short passage from John's Gospel this morning, John the Baptist refers to Jesus using three different names. And I'd like to us to consider them each briefly in turn. When John saw Jesus coming towards him, he says in verse 29, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There can be no doubt that John had in mind the sacrificial aspects of the Lamb title. Some of the well-known Old Testament images of the Lamb come readily to mind, don't they? The Lamb provided by God for Abraham, which he sacrificed rather than his own son Isaac. Many of you, I'm sure, will remember the lamb of Isaiah chapter 53, who was led to the slaughter for the sins of God's people. And then, of course, most famously of all, the Passover lamb of Exodus chapter 12, whose blood was painted on the door frames of the Israelites' homes, which ensured that the angel of death would pass over them on that terrible night of judgment. John, in giving Jesus this name, is preparing us for the fact that Jesus will be sacrificed in a similar way to that Passover lamb, the lamb that enabled the Israelites to be set free from their captives, the Egyptians. Note where this lamb comes from. He's provided by God himself, which resonates again, doesn't it, with the story of Abraham and Isaac. This is the lamb. The one who is to set his people free is a gift to us from God himself. Recognise also the significance of this lamb, for he will take away sin. Here, the image is of the scapegoat. You remember, I'm sure, how the Old Testament priest laid his hands on the head of the lamb 
transferring the guilt of the people to the animal. And then the creature was released in the wilderness to proclaim the removal of guilt. In my experience, this is one aspect of the gospel that we need to be reminded of time and time again. So many of us seem to struggle for survival beneath the crushing burdens of guilt. But Christ, the Lamb of God, really has borne it all for us. He says to us, daughter, son, your sins are forgiven. And elsewhere, we're reminded in the letter to the Hebrews, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Finally, notice the scope of the Lamb's ministry, the sins of the whole world. Without any exception, every kind of sin and evil is covered. There is no sin to heinous, no wickedness too terrible, no habitual failure too often repeated that it cannot be taken away by Jesus, our heavenly lamb. So Jesus is the lamb of God, but he's also the baptizer with the spirit. Earlier in John's Gospel, John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Christ, which means the anointed one or the one whom the Spirit anoints. And so in our passage this morning, John shares the complementary truth that Jesus also dispenses the Spirit to his people. Baptism is a rite of initiation. John the Baptist's baptism initiated its recipients into readiness for the coming of the Messiah. In the New Testament church, baptism initiated the baptised into the family of God. To entitle Jesus the baptizer with the Spirit means primarily that he is the one through whom we are initiated into God's kingdom, through the receiving the life of God, the Holy Spirit. In essence, Jesus has the Spirit in order that he may give the Spirit to those who believe and trust in him. In the book of Judges, and the two books of Samuel, there are descriptions of God's spirit coming down on Israel's judges and kings. The difference with King Jesus is that the spirit remains on him. In Isaiah, we see that God's servant will also have the spirit resting on him. Thus, the coming of the spirit on Jesus at his baptism points to the fulfilment of these two great Old Testament themes. He is the king who will rule forever and the servant who will die for sin. So then Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the baptizer with the Spirit. And the third name that John the Baptist gives to Jesus is that he is the Son of God. The title Son of God was actually given to Jesus at his baptism by his father, as recorded in, Mook, in Mark and Luke's Gospels. At Jesus' baptism, the father makes it clear that he delights in his son. God says from heaven, with him I am well pleased. As Son of God... Jesus brings delight to the heart of the Father. The whole purpose of John the Baptist's ministry is to reveal God's Son. 
God's words from heaven at the moment of Jesus' baptism, together with the fact that the Holy Spirit rests and remains on Jesus once he's been baptised, enable John to appreciate who Jesus is, the Son of God. The Baptist's repeated statement, I myself did not know him, reminds us also, doesn't it, of God's determination to make himself known and also to assure us that this really is God's son because God himself witnesses to him. So what? So what did all this mean to those who heard John the Baptist? The Baptist's words about Jesus persuaded people that Jesus really was the long-awaited Messiah and also convinced them that Jesus' central purpose in becoming flesh was to be the Lamb of God. The Baptist was an authentic spokesman who identified the Messiah using a whole range of Old Testament criteria. And Jesus' call to the disciples, which follows on from today's passage, assured them that John the Baptist's witness about Jesus was true. They're convinced about who Jesus is and therefore turn to follow him. The so what, for you and I, must be to follow the same lines as those original hearers. We should listen to John the Baptist afresh and open our eyes to see the identity and purpose of this long-awaited Messiah. We should see the disciples responding to Jesus' call and learn from them that the Baptist's witness is valid and that the Messiah really has arrived. And surely this can only lead us to worship, can't it? To live the whole of our lives for God. So we're called to recognise once again the truth of who Jesus is and to respond in awe, wonder and worship to the God who sent his only son, the Lamb of God, and the one who gives us new life through the power of the Spirit. As we seek to live for the risen Christ in these unusual days, can I encourage you to ponder afresh the names of Jesus that we've been reminded about this morning? Can I also encourage you to turn these ponderings into prayer and to praise for the one who, in Christ, sets us free and lavishes eternal life upon us? <laughs>